Grandpa Buffett, old, senile, he has no idea what he's doing in the stock market anymore. Now that's not what I personally think, but I've been seeing a lot of comments expressing that exact sentiment all over these videos that I've been doing. It's funny because all of a sudden everybody knows better than Warren Buffett. Now Buffett is just some old dude going into cash and stuffing it all under his mattress just like, you know, old people do. It's not like the market and economy are extremely uncertain and that cash is an actual prudent position. No, 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 it's just because he's old as if he wasn't old back in 2008 when he made a killing as if all that knowledge he built up over his lifetime is just gone now and the best comments are the ones that say that buffett is absolutely wrong because obviously the fed would never let the market crash again we're in a forever bull market now sure that makes sense so in this video we're going to talk about buffett and whether the fed will prove him wrong with all their money printing but at the end of the day regardless of what buffett and the fed are doing you're going to need your own strategy and that's why we put together this free training to help you out with that there's a link in this video and down below in the description and comments you could go there take this training and you'll know exactly how i invest in the market you'll have my full strategy step by step as it says right here very useful to get this strategy in place so you know exactly when to buy and when to sell when to take profits when to cut losses all that good stuff that goes into a strategy and makes you successful in the stock market anyway check that training out it's free so as we know buffett is in a lot of cash right now because he's not confident in this economy and stock market and when people ask him why he's not swooping in when all these companies dropped he's saying that he's not seeing any good deals and things aren't the same as what happened in the previous crisis a lot of professional money managers are thinking the same thing as we've been over in the last few videos they've been trying to short this market non-stop and they continuously get blown out because to them it doesn't make sense that the market continues to go up even as the economy is in such a bad place right now and then you have retail people on the other hand like the people using Robinhood and smaller accounts they're just crushing this market they rode this whole wave up and have been making Making so much money so it's the whole retail versus pro who's correct in this so far it's been the retail crowd which is awesome to see but where retail gets it wrong is when you start saying that the market is never gonna crash again because of the Federal Reserve it's true that the Fed and Jerome Powell they've done a great job but for there to never be a crash again is that possible no that's a stretch because is there any market in history that didn't have ups and downs that didn't have crashes is there anything that just went straight up with no volatility no, that's never gonna happen as long as we have something called credit. I'm not just talking about credit cards, I'm talking about loans and debt and all these things that you can do to borrow money and spend it. And it's not just credit by itself, it's credit mixed with people. And no matter how much the Fed stimulates this market, they can't control it. The market only moves based off people themselves. And that's why when they say the markets are all psychology, that's true because markets are all people. And if you really wanna understand how this works with credit and people, then you gotta understand short and long-term term debt cycles. So we're going to go over that real quick with our research from MacroOps. And debt cycles are really the basis for all our macro research at MacroOps because credit is so important to an economy and it determines so many things. And you might have heard of short and long-term debt cycles before because of Ray Dalio. Little commie Dalio, the CCP's whipping boy. Is he a closet commie? Maybe. Either way though, his research, pretty solid if you take out all the China stuff. And that's where we learned a lot about these debt cycles from Bridgewater's research, Ray Dalio and his team. So the first thing that you got to understand is that our economic machine, like our global economy, starts with money. But money isn't just cash, like cold hard cash in your wallet, it's also credit. And credit is actually the main part that you should focus on. Because in the US, the supply of physical cash is roughly 3 trillion, but credit is near 60 trillion. So most of the buying that happens is through credit, it's not through cash. That's why it's so important. So when you pay for something with cash, you exchange cash for that service or good, right? And then the transaction is closed, it's complete. You don't got to deal with that person anymore. But when you buy something with credit, you're promising to pay for it in the future if you get that good or service right now. That means the transaction is not complete until, you know, you pay that guy back. So if we think about the difference between credit and cash, credit could actually be created out of thin air. You don't even need the central bank or the U.S. Treasury. All you need are two people saying, OK, yeah, I'll give you this now if you pay me back later. And there you go. Credit and money has just been created. The lender now has an asset because, you you know he's owed money and the person who borrowed gave him that IOU has the liability now and that stays there until that transaction is closed 
with the debt being repaid. So this ability to literally create money compounds over time, and that's what causes cycles. And these credit cycles are what drive the economy. So there's really three forces working together here. First, you have long-term productivity growth. Then you have the short-term debt cycle, which is the business cycle, and you have the long-term debt cycle. So we're going to see how that all fits together. So the first one is long-term productivity growth with the line going straight up like this. So over time, the economy or the real GDP per capita averages 2% growth. And that 2% basically comes from, you know, our new technology, all the knowledge that we're creating as a group of people. We become more productive over time because of that knowledge. And I know it might not feel like it because everyone loves saying things were way better back in the day. But the truth is, you know, society is so much better than the generations before us. Every time you flush a toilet, you just got to remember that. People didn't even have running water back in the day. Buffett talked about this too. He said, indeed, most of today's children are doing well. All families in my upper middle class neighborhood regularly enjoy a living standard better than that achieved by John D. Rockefeller Sr. at the time of my birth. His unparalleled fortune couldn't buy what we now take for granted, whether the field is, to name just a few, transportation, entertainment, communication, or medical services. Rockefeller didn't have Netflix. Rockefeller certainly had power and fame. He could not, however, live as well as my neighbors do now. So this 2% seems small, and you might not notice it in your day-to-day -day life. But if you're ever feeling bad about yourself one day, just go back and think about how they had to live. Even the richest people back then when you didn't have the technology. But as I say that, you know, to look back into the past to make yourself feel better about now, no one does it. Because you're not trying to compare your life to people in the past, you're trying to compare it to the people around you right now. And usually the people that are wealthier than you. So of course, none of us are going to be satisfied with the 2% average increase in our living standards. Instead, we're going to borrow money to make up for that gap. This dude next door is not going to be getting a new boat without us getting a new boat too. But if you don't have the money, what do you do? You borrow it. And this is actually a biological thing that we love to borrow and spend money. Jason Zweig talked about it in his book. He said when people borrow and spend money, it's really the reward centers of the brain that become activated. When you borrow money, you're not thinking about the long-term consequences, but the short-term result. You got more cash in your pocket and that feels good. So this credit, this creating money out of thin air, of course, it's like a drug. And being able to borrow deludes us into thinking that we can outpace this 2% increase in living standards per year. Because the truth is you can't. Because in the long run, you could only consume and spend money on as much as you can produce or earn. You can keep borrowing and borrowing above your earnings, but guess what? You're going to have to pay that back eventually, right? And when you spend more than you earn, you create a bad debt and that debt will not be repaid. So you can see where we're going with this, right? A bunch of people start borrowing, then eventually, oh, they can't pay it back. So you can see where we're going with it, right? With this picture right here, a bunch of people start borrowing so that, hey, you're above that 2%, but eventually it gets out of control. No one can pay their debts back and you drop below that 2%. So instead of going on a nice steady line upward, you know, just based off your 2% productivity growth as a people. Everyone's trying to borrow to get above it and then they end up falling below. And that's why you get those cycles, those little waves all the way up this line. That's why you get these little squigglies, the short-term debt cycle. It's the credit cycle. It's the business cycle. It's all one thing. Boom and bust. It's because of credit. See, the cycles oscillate around that 2% productivity trend line. Those are the debt cycles. They're comprised of leveragings and deleveragings of debt and credit. So when you're borrowing, all you're doing is pulling your future consumption forward while causing that temporary increase in productivity above that 2% average. You're pulling your consumption forward because you know, you're taking that money that you would have made later, hopefully, and spending it now. And it's pulled forward because in the future you have to pay it back. So during the leveraging period is when we go above that 2% line. And then we go through a deleveraging period where we got to get rid of all that bad debt. And that's when we fall below the 2% line. When we're above 2%, you know, that's the bullish run. That's when everything is great. Everyone's feeling good. When we're below the 2% line and we're deleveraging, you know, that's the recession time. So it's not all determined just by the Fed. You know, it's people, it's what we're doing. But if you get into the short-term debt cycles, you will see the Fed does play a big part, but their power is limited. So the short-term debt cycle, also known as the business cycle, those oscillations we were just talking about, they occur every five to seven years. And they do result from the Federal Reserve, like Jerome Powell, easing and tightening money. And they do that with their interest rate manipulation. They get to determine the interest rates in the economy. So if they lower interest rates, what happens? Well, credit becomes 
more attractive so people and businesses borrow more because it's cheaper, right? Lower interest rates means you don't gotta pay as much in interest when you borrow that money. And then people's existing debt that they already borrowed before, that becomes cheaper to service. Your payments go down. So again, if your payments are down, then maybe you could borrow even more. And then there's a third more complicated effect where the discount rate, which is the interest rate, when that's lowered, investors reevaluate their investments. If you've heard of a discounted cash flow analysis, it uses that interest rate to determine, you know, what's the present value of future cash flows of a company. And lower interest rates affects that to the point where for the investors, it looks like a better deal to buy more. And financial spreads tighten during that period. So anyway, like I said, if there's cheaper debt, then, you know, people are going to be influenced to buy more. Demand will increase because they could borrow and buy. But that starts to inflate asset prices, homes, businesses, stocks, everything. And as that happens, people's net worth rises because if the value of your house, you know, went up, well, you could remortgage, get a second mortgage, make some more money on it, throw it in the stock market, and you get this crazy loop. Keep borrowing and things keep going up. It all looks good. It's a reflexive process, George Soros style, which we talked about in a previous video. You're buying assets. Everyone's buying assets so that the assets you own, they go up in price. And all of a sudden you have a stronger credit profile so you could borrow even more. Positive feedback loop. But eventually you bump up against the upper limit. You bump up against the productive capacity, which is the limit of what an economy can actually create. Like you could make credit way faster than what an economy can realistically support. So what happens is that inflation takes hold. This is called demand pull inflation. So all of a sudden you got way too much money chasing after too few goods because the economy can't produce enough goods for all these people that are trying to buy it up. And what happens, you know, when there's too few goods with too much money that drives prices up. So you get your demand pull inflation, but the fed, they're supposed to be there to regulate inflation, right? So when inflation starts going up, that's when they raise interest rates. And when they do that, you know, the whole feedback loop goes into reverse because all of a sudden the cost of debt increases. You got to pay more to borrow money and the stuff you already borrowed, your payments went up on that too. So everything gets kicked into reverse where people stop borrowing, they stop spending and you get a fall in demand, which hurts asset prices. They drop until, you know, you're below that 2%. Things are looking bad. You're in a recession. And the fed says, oh, we got to cut rates again to stimulate things. So it's really a stupid game of increasing rates and then cutting them. Once again, all of us oscillating like idiots around this 2% growth line of actual productivity. But here's the thing. When the fed has to cut again to stimulate again, well, this time, because debts are higher than they were before, the fed has to cut interest rates even lower than they were before. So here's a good graph of how interest rates work. So if you take it from the eighties, interest rates continuously drop. You see, they have spikes, right? When the fed raises, but over time, you got to keep going to a lower and lower low. So then obviously the next question would be what happens when you get too low, when you hit, you know, 2% or 0%, what happens when the fed can't lower rates anymore? Last time that happened, you know, we had a few wars around that time period. We had a great depression where a lot of things were cleared out. Well, when you reach that zero point or even negative, this is where you pivot into the long-term debt cycle. And that's this long wave right here. And people don't really talk about the long-term debt cycle because it's on such a long time frame. It only becomes noticeable at transition points, which occur once every generation, every 25 to 50 years. And when you get to this point, this is when the Fed really can't do anything more to stimulate the economy because you just can't accumulate debt forever. That's not how it works. Eventually, interest rates can't get lowered anymore to keep things going. When they reach the zero bound, there's no amount of credit easing that can induce people to borrow and spend more. The accumulated debt levels become too high and the servicing costs too large. The credit system becomes maxed out. And that's when you get some serious issues with, you know, like a Great Depression style situation because all that credit and all that debt that's been accumulated over a generation, even with all our business cycles, our little booms and busts, it turns into one big bust. And that's where the Fed doesn't really have any power because the Fed isn't controlling the market. They can do a little bit in the short term, but over the long term, because our system is ran off of credit, we're going to face this situation. So what happened just now with the Fed making this huge response because of this CCPV, which is what I'm going to call the coronavirus from now on. Well, the Fed may have successfully stemmed off a crisis, at least in the short term. And this is where a lot of the professionals might be wrong because you could have looked at this and looked at how low our interest rates were already and thought, OK, the Fed is screwed here. There's nothing that can save this. Not any amount of stimulus is going to work. We're at the end of the long term debt cycle. This is the time. This is going to be the huge crisis. But no, the Fed is creative. They got quantitative easing and a bunch of other stuff. They still have tools. But even with all their new ways to stimulate the economy, that doesn't mean that they fix things. All it means is that they kick the can down the road, which we still, you know, don't have confirmation of. Like this market might turn around again and we still might get that big crisis. But if we don't, that doesn't mean that it's never coming because it is still coming. Now, 
not just in the US, but globally too. These are cycles that have always played out forever, as long as there has been a credit-based system. And I'm not saying a credit-based system is bad per se, you know, it just is what it is. That's a whole different discussion. And does it even matter? Because are we ever gonna get off this credit system? No, probably not. So you gotta make sure that you're prepared instead of saying, hey, another crash is never coming. And you also don't wanna be like the professionals getting stuck on the idea that this has to be the crisis. Cause it might not be, it might be 10 years from now. Who knows? It's very difficult to time these things. Yeah, we said this happens every 50 to 75 years, but that's a loose estimate. But honestly, regardless of what the Fed does and what the economy and stock market does, you should be okay as long as you have your strategy in place. I know I say this all the time, but it's true. Market going up, market going down, you could still make money as long as you're controlling your risk. And again, we talk about all of that in this free training. There's a link in this video and down below in the description and comments. So don't rely on the Fed to keep the market up forever. Just rely on yourself to have the right strategy to play it either way. This training should help. And if you like this video, make sure you subscribe because we got more coming. Hit that subscribe button and I will see you in the next one. Stay foul out there. Bye.